So we're officially starting this wonderful session and so, so happy that you made it, <laughs> that you're here. Uh, so welcome, Klaus. You've already had a chance to connect to the group nicely, so that's very good. Uh, the session today, I have to say that I was, I think one of the first sessions I attended with you, Klaus, was on metaphors and the strength yeah. of metaphors. Um, and I've been using them and going deeper into them since I've met you. So I thank you very much for that. And the solutions flow through bottlenecks is also another beautiful metaphor that will uh, lead us through the session today. So you asked me to introduce you in the strangest way ever uh, to say that you have are a recovering biologist. So I think that awakens more curiosity than anything else. Um, also a recovering ex-manager and you're working currently as an OD consultant. And I think this is where we're gonna see the beauty of your work and learn with you here today. And an old solutionist and soul world photographer, uh, which we have a lot of pictures to thank you for. So hoping that we'll continue this year uh, in Vienna and hoping many of you will be joining in Vienna. So the SFIO is very happy to host these sessions and the floor is yours, enjoy. Thank you very much, Annie. And uh, yes, indeed, it's very nice to see people from different phases of that long journey uh, along the solution-focused uh, ideas. Uh, Yoram, I've met in the very first uh, one in Bristol 20 years ago now, and uh, other people along the way in different places and locations. And I'm looking forward to seeing some of you again this year in, in Vienna, in Susanna's place. Lovely. Uh, my idea here is to introduce, to connect solution focus with a different focus, which is about constraints, as is mentioned in the title. Another word for constraints is bottlenecks. And uh, for the last couple of years, I really enjoyed very much and I profited a lot, even economically, from a combination of solution focus and a focus on constraints. And that's what I wanted to share here. I've prepared a lot of slides. Uh, don't be afraid. It's more like, you know, those little devices for kids where you have this, this paper movie thing where you just you flip through and you create some kind of like the impression of movement. That is my hope that I can go through the slides rather quick, especially as in the first half, it's about concepts, you know, already. So lean back, you know, a little bit and feel like in the cinema, the show is on and the show is about two things that are dear to my heart. And one of those, you know, already one of those is solution focus. And it's only one half of the glasses. You could say that's the green glass. And you can combine that with another focus, which is a focus on constraints. And that creates, as you know, when you have two sides, one eye sees not the same thing as the other one, that creates this double vision, or in this case, even a 3D vision. You know, depth is created by the two eyes seeing different pictures. And with respect to your well being, that creates flow. And flow here, I mean, in a double sense. One sense is the psychological flow, this really enhanced feeling present and challenged and well. And the other, which I would like to focus on first, is workflow, which is economically creating value, creating flow along a value stream. And at the end, you have a happy customer who is happy to pay the bills. And yet then you have financial flow and that combines to solutions both for you as a consultant and for the, for the client. The ancestors of the first one, everybody here knows uh, the, the persons or the pictures by Insu and Steve, who both uh, deceased meanwhile, uh, the ancestors of constraints focus is less well known in this community, but there's a separate community where everybody knows Eli Goldratt, a physicist from Israel who uh, moved to uh, America, became a consultant and wrote his first book about uh, the goal in 1984 around that. And the other two Rami and Efrat live in Israel, are his son and his daughter, and these two I met and Insu I met. 
I would like to start the story to tell the story top down. And I mean that literally. I'd like to move to the top of the Swiss Alps. Uh, this is a photograph taken in 2005. And you may know a couple of people here. There's Mark McCurgo, there's Insu Kimberg still alive, there's Bjorn Johansen still alive, and the back is Kirsten Dierolf and, and a couple of other people. And this is on top of the Schildhorn, and there we had a nice book launch. And the book launch was Danny Meyer's book on solution focus in teams. And in that book, I found my agenda for today. Because on page 85 in the book, Danny introduced the change formula by a guy by the name uh, Julio Olaya, a Chilean coach who worked with the former finance minister of Chile, Fernando Flores, founded a company, emigrated to states, et cetera, et cetera. And he said the following. He said, change in any social system does happen under the following conditions. When the product of will, which other people might call sense of urgency or other people might call motivation, will times the appeal of the goal times confidence in its feasibility times clarity of the first step. When the product of this is greater than the estimated effort involved, then change happens. And when it isn't, it doesn't. And I was intrigued by that. And I realized when I became self-employed, I was absolutely sure that is an attractive future. I was very confident in that it's possible and I had no idea about the first step. So it took a long time for me to get started. But here I am 20 years later and it worked out well. So my agenda for the next 30 some slides is to say a little bit about attractiveness or appeal of the goal the tool for that is a miracle question, and my tool for that is the SF, the Solution Focus Matrix, to talk a little bit about confidence in its feasibility. The tool for that is scaling, and you know that in manageries that, that might be converted into um, um, CSFs. I'll come back to that. Uh, I just forget the, the um, key, key success fa factors. KPI, sometimes it's called, key performance indicators. And here it's crucial success factors. Then about clarity of the first step, this is where we are going to switch from solution focus to constraints focus. Because here you can use this double vision, zooming in, zooming out, using the right eye, the left eye. You can use my wishbone model, and then we get straight to the constraint. And here we will have a little breakout session. And after the breakout, we'll uh, fast forward to the aspect of effort and constraints focus knows a lot about how to make resources more productive without them working harder. It's just making the system smarter and not the people working harder. And how that can be done, I'd like to introduce with the help of a metaphor. And the final remarks are about a mix of topics about donuts and context and hearts and flows. We'll get to that. Before I get there, I'd like to invite you to find a personal issue. What do I mean by issue? Anything that is relevant enough for you to like to think about that now in the back of your mind for a couple of minutes, invest a couple of minutes of your lifetime, and something where you do have hope that it can be improved. Not unsolvable problems of uh, we have enough of those in the world, but anything where you do have hope that it could be improved as we are in SFIO, it might be about organizational work and you will especially, you should be ready until slide number 22. That's the slide for the first breakout session. And then you can use your topic. If at any point in time you have questions, um, probably the best way to do that might be to raise your electronic hand and still even then I might not see it because on my screen I only have partial view of the people so maybe Annie could have a, a look at any people raising their hands and then interrupt me and let me know. Until then here is my movie. The first tool probably most of you know it's the solution matrix or the SF matrix 
this is a matrix combining the dimension of time from past over present to future with a dimension of value. If you use the six thinking heads by Edwards de Bonnewier, six colors for, for thinking modes, so the past is about facts, which is already fixed, so he has the white color. The future is not known yet, so this is still potentiality. For that, he has the green color. And if you combine that with, with value, value on a scale from 0 to 10, 10 is wonderful, 0 is the opposite, or in the colors, the black color for risky, dangerous, bad, and the sunny yellow for wonderful, beautiful, welcome, beneficial, then you create a matrix with four squares. And solutions, when we talk about solutions, of course, that's the top left square. This is where it's good and where you can still go from today into the future. The other squares, top left, is the beautiful past, but it's past. Uh, down left is the rotten or traumatic past, where things were bad. And down right is the dreaded future, where things might go wrong or become worse. And solution means between now and the future, and better than the dreaded future, hopefully even better than now. And of course, the future perfect is if it's well from now into the infinite future, future perfect. So as we work in coaching on consulting, models like these have to be translated into questions because consulting is the art and craft of asking useful questions. So you can translate that into questions depending on where your client's attention is. If people are telling you a story about the wonderful things ahead that they're dreaming of, you're asking questions, asking them to become more concrete. What else is helpful now? Who will do what with whom until when? What is the first step and can we start now? If people instead are talking about the dreaded future, you ask questions that try to turn their attention around. How could that be reversed? How can you cope well with the unavoidable? What should happen instead? And what else, what else, what else? If people's attention is in the wonderful past, you can ask them what helped in the past and how could that be repeated? What did they do themselves? Uh, ben Fuhrman's question, how did you do that? He, uh, when Ben Fuhrman says, even the back uh, forest people in Finland know how to say, how did you do that? And uh, how could you repeat that? And which part of that would be recycled and how? And then you get to the present and to the future. And if somebody is in the rotten past, you can ask people, how did you survive? How did you respond? How come it wasn't even worse? And what was great about that problem? And what strength did you build? People from different communities may recognize that questions like these, for the hypnotherapeutic people, these are embedded suggestions. For the complexity people, these are catalytic probes in strange attractors. For the NLP people, there are presuppositions, or for the TOC people, there are assumptions contained in the questions. Never mind, we'll get to some of those a little bit later. So the first time I introduced this model was in 2006 in Vienna. So this year is really a re revival and return to Vienna. That's when Insu was still alive and was present in the beer garden at the end of the, of the whole conference. And 13 years later, namely in 2019 in Budapest, I found the same model presented much more lovely than I can do that here by, by our Canadian colleague, Kaysun Moon. And she doesn't call it SF matrix, she calls it dialogical orientation quadrants. But it's exactly the same thing. And we had a wonderful conversation in, in Budapest last time. When you try to translate models like that into management, sometimes you create shapes like these, a, bit, a little bit strange, a little bit confused with a solution focus matrix that's easier. You can translate that into management lingo very easy. Top right are visions. On the way to visions, you have goals. If you cannot go to that place because there are obstacles, you have daydreams that are not yet realizable. Uh, in the dreaded future, you have what to avoid. In the bad current, you have behaviors you want to do, you want to see less of. 
in the dreaded past, you have bad experiences. In the positive past, you have experiences of all kinds that help you create skills which you can use on your way to milestones by starting with the first steps. So it's the same model just translated into managerese. And when you follow that, that arrow from where you're now, why a first step to milestones, goals, and visions, what you get then is a scale, and everybody knows that. So I can really flip through that. On a scale from zero, which is ideal, via where are you now, the as is to the to be, the way you want to go, your desired goal. And then you have three spaces. The one is the room for improvement. Between zero and where you are now is the room of resources, what enables your movement, what is okay, what is wonderful already, what helps you to act. And between the goal and the 10 is what reaching the goal is good for. So that is what delivers sense to the whole activity. And that's why I call this year the benefit of the goal or the sense making part of the scale. And in between, you have room to improve. And you can walk steps towards improvement. And you can return to this clarity of the first step. And the question is then, what is the first step? And once you know that, you can realize that the whole model can be read, the scaling can be read like, I want to take a good step. So I move out, I circulate from the good future and the resources and the potentialities, and then I make a decision, and then I zoom in on step number one. If this is too much detail, you follow Michael Yurt's plus model, which reduces the whole thing to four steps. Here is Michael at the 2004 conference in Sweden. And Michael says, you start with a platform where you are, you zoom out, you look far ahead, that's the L in the model. You remember that you have more resources that you can use to distinguish between what's bad and what's good. Find what works and what doesn't. And then you utilize the resources that you have to take a step forward. It's the same movement. Before you take a step, you, you zoom out, you circle the, or, the environment, you orient your first step, and then you take it. So the question becomes, what can we say about first steps worth taking for? Zooming out and zooming in, everybody knows from Google Maps, you know, when you wonder where is this guy Klaus talking from, I can tell you here's my address, Eichendorfstraße in Hirschberg, so you know exactly where I am, and you have no clue where it is, even on Google Maps. To know where it is, you have to zoom out. So you do something that uh, Matthias Varga from Tibet says, you include what was denied or overlooked. Then you zoom out too far, you realize, oh, that's somewhere in Europe, but you don't see any details. So when you moved out too far, you have to zoom back in. You have to differentiate what was diffuse. The one is the movement of orientation. The other is the movement of focusing and in solution-focused work and in constraint-focused work, that's the moving back and forth. That's the looking with one eye and the other eye, and then combining the two to get a 3D picture, and a 3D picture especially of the next step. The last model from solution-focused that I want, just want you to remind of, because you probably have heard that before, is the wishbone model. And that comes from the quality management tool called the fishbone, which illustrates how several components interact towards a problem. And along came Jenny Clark, who said, well, that's all nice and well, but we don't think about problems. We talk about solutions. So let's use the same model and let's call it wishbone to indicate this is delineating the components of solutions. So it's an SF fishbone tool, and my version of the wishbone looks like that. I do not want to go into detail. I would just like to sensitize you for the fact that this can be read as a scale with zero, and where are you now, and where would be good enough, and where would be 10, and what would be the first step to take, given that this happens in a context, that you have boundaries to the space where you can act 
which systemic people call restrictions. You have limited resources on the one hand as a restriction, and you have norms, laws, standard operating procedures, values, tribal etiquette, etc. And in between these restrictions, in between these boundaries, you have a degree of freedom to act. And uh, there is one point especially, which is especially interesting. And that is the point where those restrictions leave the least space. And that is exactly this point called the bottleneck, or in the theory of constraints, which is called the constraint. So focusing on the first step means focusing on the constraint between where you are now and where you want to go. And if your first step means I want to go from where I am now on the scale in to one step higher on the scale, n plus one, the interesting point before you take that step is what is limiting your space your maneuverability the most. Constraint is defined in the way that this is in the whole system of interconnecting factors in this whole wisdom, wishbone, wishbone ecosystem is the one element that limits your performance the most. That means if you change anything else and you don't change this constraining factor, it just doesn't help because it's still the constraining factor that limits the performance. So it's definitely a good idea if you want to increase the performance of a system to know something about the constraint and to focus your efforts to improve the working of the constraint. And this is indicated here in the wishbone model. You can go to Nancy Klein's time to think uh, heuristics and her way of asking about the constraint is what is your most limiting belief, because our beliefs are what create constraints on the outside. So much for movie part one. With that, I would like to invite you into breakout rooms and talk a little bit about these questions. Uh, for now, Whatever you learned, the invitation is to go to the second part of this movie. And now the focus is more on the pink glass rather than on the green glass. But, okay. What you should see here is a spider web and a table. And this is just one way of transferring that idea of scaling that everybody in this loose focus world knows over again to a management world. And asking for if you were in a project or if you were thinking about the success, the successful performance of a company or another organization into their future, what are the things you need to get right? The critical success factors, the key performance indicators. And this is a very simple pen and paper tool where you can track eight CSFs, critical success factors by just scaling them. So you enter what you think is a critical success factor on the left side in those segments of the circles, one, two, three, through eight. You choose your critical success factors and then you scale. What do you think on a scale from 10? This is ideally expressed to zero. This is not expressed to at all. Where are we now? You write in an N for now at the scaling point and then you get an area for the now, and you do that again for, and where would it be if it were good enough? So you create an overview with the help of eight simultaneous scalings. And then you see areas where you are pretty much to where you want to be, and others where you're pretty far away. And that invites you to focus. And you could, for example, focus on the one factor where you have the longest journey yet to take, where the distance between now and good enough is the biggest. So from orientation, zooming out, then you zoom in, you say, okay, now I choose this factor, this CSF, the next focus, the step number one. 
and you think about how would I know if I were one step higher on the scale with respect to this factor? How would that factor be just a little bit better? And then you continue to lose focus working on this one factor. And when you're happy with that, you return to the overview, choose your next focus, choose what would be n plus one, and then you work on that. It's overview and focus, overview and focus. And again, the idea is what, you, what should you focus on? Well, there's a nice illustration from a colleague of mine from Austria. He said, here's how a constraint works. You have a flow of events to do something, create something, create value for the customer or fight the fire in this case. And between the many elements, there's one that is the rate limiting step. There is the constraining factor, the thing that limits the performance of the system the most. Here it's the small guy with the small bucket that constrains the chain. And the whole theory of constraints by Eli Goldratt is how do you make best use of constraints that you always have? And he claims that every performing system at every point in time has one constraining factor. And that's what he calls the big C constraint, the constraint. And the idea, if you think about your clients, your working systems, under the assumption that there was one factor constraining the performance, then it's immediately clear that whatever you do that does not improve the flow through the constraint by increasing the speed of flow or the diameter, the gauge of the constraint, is wasted effort because your performance does not improve when you fiddle with other places in the system. The point in the system with the maximum leverage for performance improvement is the constraint. And that what makes it so interesting to focus on the constraint. And that's what he described in the book in 84 called the goal that has been sold 6 million times in the meantime, uh, interesting long bestseller. And he created a whole set of management technologies. We will not go into any details for production, for project management, for marketing and sales, for supply chains, for accounting, for logical analysis, and for continuous improvement processes. And the common element in all those is find the constraint and handle the constraint well to make the most of it. There's a couple of people who are well known who did just that. Maybe some of you know this guy, Jeff Bezos. He founded Amazon on exactly those principles. And he uh, said in an interview, so here's my advice. If you're in the business world anywhere or dealing with management or strategizing, read the goal. You can thank me later. He was building Amazon on the principle of find the constraint and just focus on the next constraint, next, next to growth. And he did quite well. I mean, maybe not on the human side, I won't judge about that, but with respect to business performance, he did well. Elon Musk is another one. And the idea of the constraint is not a new idea. German chemists like Karl Sprengel in 1828 or Justus von Liebig, a couple of years later, 1856, already described that for corn growing, agriculture. They said, if you analyze what limits the growth of corn, it may be sodium, it may be potassium. But if sodium is the limiting factor, it doesn't help to throw more potassium at the ground. The limiting factor still is the sodium. So you have to focus on the limiting factor. There's another guy well known in management, Andy Grove. He's the founder of Intel, the chip producing company. And he wrote in 1983, so around the same time as the goal, about high output management. And he was a chemical engineer and he knew that idea of rate determining step or constraint. And Clark Ching from New Zealand, he said, if your team runs faster than your bottleneck, they're just being busy, not productive. 
So the idea is to align the capacity of your constraint to the inflow of new work, and then you get maximum performance. This can be illustrated with a tubing. You have an inflow to the left side and you have an outflow to the right side. If you have 10 units inflow on the left side, but the constraint only lets through five units, what is outflowing is not the 10 units you put in, but only the five units that the constraint lets through. And this is a metaphor for management systems. This could be a company. So you have sales, you have product development, you have design, you have engineering, project management, account management, and you put in some work. And engineering in this example is the constraint. So when everybody is still being idle, engineering is already quite busy. You add more projects and engineering reaches their limit. If you add even more projects, engineering's capacity is being decreased because everybody's running wildly around, multitasking, jumping from one project to the next and being confused. So if you push, you decrease the performance. It doesn't help. Pushing beyond the capacity of the constraints does not create performance. It creates traffic jam. You simply jam up the system. But how many of your clients work in a push mode? I remember one client who told me, if I don't demand 300%, I'll never get out 100%. I said, well, think again. If you ask 300%, everybody's traffic jammed and nothing goes. It's like in, in a highway, you know, you have few cars, everything is running smoothly. You have too many cars on the road, you get a traffic jam. So only when you adapt the inflow to the capacity of the constraint, you get maximum throughput, maximum performance. How do you do that? You measure the flow through the constraint and you link the flow through the constraint with how much you allow in. And Eli Goldratt called the constraint the drum, like on a slavery ship, you know, the drum that determines how fast people are rowing. And there's a signal change chain he calls the rope, and the drum regulates the inflow to the capacity of the constraint. If you add a buffer, I'll talk about the buffer at another time. You have some, some uh, security capacity at other places in the system. And then the whole model is called drum buffer rope. But the basic idea is accept that your system has a constraint and limit the work you try to get through the system to the working capacity at the constraint. There's one other metaphor that nicely illustrates that, how you do that. Suppose you are the harbor master. You are the person responsible for sending your people to offloading the ships. Now you have three workers to make things easy. And you know that to unload a ship takes three worker days. Now you have three ships at the same time. What do you do? Usually you can translate ships to projects or other types of work in your company. Here the metaphor is about ships. Usually the captain of the ship says, unload my ship now. I'm important, get working. So to keep everybody happy, you say, okay, you get one, you get one, you get one. So everybody gets one worker. It takes three worker days. So how long does it take to unload the ship? Three days for every ship. Easy. Three worker days, one worker. It takes three days to unload the ship when you spread your resources thin. When you focus your resources, when you limit your work in process, your whip, your work in process, and say, no, one ship after the other. You send all three workers to the first ship. It takes one day to unload the ship. Three workers, one day is three working days. On the second day, you send everybody to the second ship. On the third day, you send everybody to the third ship. Still, the third ship is finished on the third day, but everybody else finishes early. On average, in the first version, 
unloading a ship on average takes three days. In the second version, on average, it takes two days. You gain 30% productivity just by rearranging the sequence, just by limiting the amount of ships that you work on to the capacity of your people, to the constraint. You, you do not use more resources. You don't, do not unload less ships. You just change the sequence. You limit your whip from three ships at the same time to one ship at the same time. And when you limit your whip, you increase the speed of flow through the constraint. And that is one of three laws around constraint. The first one is called Little's Law because it was invented by a guy with the name John Little, and it was invented back in 1961. And it's still true. There's a paper on the 15th anniversary that's already 10 years old. And basically, he says, your lead time, the time it takes from start to finish, is proportional to your whip. The more things you try to do in parallel, the longer everything takes. And then there's two more guys I would like to introduce you to. There's a guy, Martin Erlang, he says, and it's even worse. When you utilize your people to the max, you create waiting queues. And the queues grow by the square of the utilization, which translated to non-mathematical terms just means queues grow much faster the more you squeeze your people. Now, in cost-cutting times, everybody tries to squeeze people, and what do you get? Delays, delays, delays. You create queues by squeezing people and resources exponentially. And the third guy, by the name of Kingman, he said, if you have variation in the system, statistical variation, and in every organization that tries to innovate, you need variation. If you have variation in the system, then you have a trade-off between resource efficiency and flow efficiency which means if you want to, re to, to utilize your resources, your flow suffers. That's very easy to see. For example, how long does it take for you to answer your average email? If it's just a short question, maybe it takes 30 seconds. How long does it take until you have time to read the email? Maybe a day. So your flow efficiency is 30 seconds divided by one day. It's way below 1%. There's a lot of mathematical details that I skip. What's the idea? What does that mean? Little's law, limit the whip. Erlang's law, avoid waiting queues. And Kingman's law, if you have variations, look for the flow rather than the resources. What does it mean? Translate it into management. If there's more work worth doing than you have capacity, and that's always true, then please visualize all work you have. Prioritize it clearly. Limit your whip. Apply a pull system, not a push system, which may mean when new work comes along, you have to triage the work. You have to decide, do we have capacity to do it now? Then we do it now. Will we have capacity to do it later Then we postpone and do it later? Will we not have capacity later? Then we kill it now. We don't take it. That is triage. Triage incoming work to limit the whip to the capacity of your constraint, and then you have maximum flow. And once you can do that, then apply a continuous improvement process to keep the system evolving and to add even more performance. That's it. I mean, the question is, how do you identify the constraint? How do you work with it? There's a lot of detail. But suppose you knew all that. These are typical results that last week a colleague from Holland presented. He was working for a public hospital. He applied this constraints management to the hospital. And before they had a due date of performance of only 50%, 
after applying constraints management, they were beyond their 80s, up to 95% due date performance. Lead time was cut down in half, WIP was cut down in half, the quality was much better than before, and the output rose by 20 to 40%. Translate that to your average client. What would it mean for your client to deliver in half the time and increase their revenues by 20 to 40 percent. What would that mean for your client? I have worked for one client and they had an average delay in their projects, average lead time. The planned time was three years. The average delay was six months. Six months times 600 projects in parallel means 300 project years delay every year. That means 300 project years loss of income every year. A year later, their, de their average delay was zero. And the people were happy. And the only thing we did was focus on the constraint and utilize the constraint max by working smarter. So to summarize with some final remarks here, I have four final perspectives. One is with the first pair of glasses, you have the green and the red, you know, the solutions focus and the constraint focus. And one idea is you put both on both pieces of your vision. That would be not a two colored, but a bifocal glasses. You combine solution focus and constraint focus all the time. Maybe you combine even more perspectives. Suppose you could have insect vision, you know, all those many eyes delivering input at the same time. You would have a much broader picture. And still with a much broader picture, you could orient yourself faster, but then you still would have to focus on the constraint of the system. But you have a broader input for orientation, not for focusing. It would be like in the saying, in, in the notion of Marshall Proust, Marshall Proust where he said, um, discovering does not mean traveling to foreign lands, but seeing with new eyes. And you would have new eyes with that bifocal vision of the focus, the solution focus and the constraint focus. And with those in insect eyes, you would include many more contexts into your orientation phase. And you would do something which Nora Bateson, whom you see here at the 2011 Sol World Conference in Hungary at that time, talking about her father, Gregory Bateson, that you can see in the back in her, in the documentary, which she calls transcontextual work. You look at many contexts at the same time. You realize you're being a consultant and a mother and a citizen of Canada and, and, and. And you use all those contexts to orient your work and then to focus now what is the most limiting element on the way to where I want to go. So do not use only one context, be transcontextual. If you want to learn more about transcontextual, here's the link to Nora's current working. There's more than one context. Of course, there's more than one flow. Psychological flow was invented by this guy here, Mihai Csikszentmihalyi. And there is a TED talk by him where he asks, how does it feel to be in flow? He has a feature list about components of flow and you can read that in the documentation a little later. Uh, an, an interesting guy who talks about that is another guy from Canada, John Verbeke, who works in Toronto and has a nice podcast on the philosophy of flow and meaning, etc. I'll keep that link in here if you want to follow up on that later on, you'll have it in the slides. The second to last thing I want to mention is something I promise to mention in every presentation I do and in every workshop, even if it's not about the topic, and that is a global systems view. There's Kate Raworth from the UK who, who invented something she calls donut economics. And she says, if we want to survive sustainably as a species on this planet in something which she calls a just corridor, 
where it, the world is humane, is safe, is fair, and is di distributive for resources. We have to consider two boundaries, two limits, two restrictions in our wishbone. And the one, she says, is the humane floor. And if we cross that boundary, then we reach conditions of inhumanity. And Victoria could sing a loud song about those conditions in war with hunger, exploitation and hunger and dangerous situations. That's the inner floor. And the outer boundary is the one of the ecological capacity of the planet. The planet sets constraints to the way how we can interact and uh, do our economics, the ecological ceiling for our economic humane interaction, biodiversity, climate, pollution in the air and waste, etc. And she says, if you look closer at her model, which has lots of details, in the nine sectors of the ecological sphere and in the 15 sectors or 13 sectors of this humane sphere, we currently violate most of those sectors at the same time. And our species will not survive if, if we continue to do that. And she has a nice website where she collects ideas. What can we do about that? She calls it Donut Economics Action Lab. And here's the link, you'll find it in the notes. If you have any comments beyond this webinar here, beyond this meeting, please, uh, if you have questions, comments, cartoons, insights, whatever, send me a mail to this address. You'll have it in the show notes. If you want further literature, I have a couple of things I could send out as handouts. You'll find that in the show notes. And in my last slide, there's an invitation which I found in Olympia, Washington, in the kitchen of a friend, and it now sits in my kitchen, and it reads like this. It's an invitation. With all your heart, say out loud, I want to live a happy, a full, a meaningful life. And to do that, share your dreams, forgive the past, dive in, take chances, be real, and all the things in between. With that, thank you very much for listening. I'm happy to take any questions that people that have to leave still have time to ask. I'm happy to return to breakout room number two for those people who still have time. And I'll be most happy to hear from you at some later point in time by firing off an email reporting, here's what I found by applying your constraints ideas to my experiments. Thank you very much from all my heart. Mm -hmm.